Thank you. I really am so excited to be here. Nestor and I know each other from Chicago, where I have been living mostly for the last 21 years, although I am a New Yorker born and bred. And this year, I've been here almost full time. But what is especially exciting for me is that this story is like our family creation myth, and the heart of the story takes place on the Lower East Side near Second Avenue. <laughs> this is like ground zero for this story, and I have never told it so close. When I was eight years old, I played Snow White, and the prince refused to kiss me. <laughs> I lay there waiting, my heart palpitating. Psst, Kenny, you're supposed to kiss me. I lay there on a hard, narrow wooden bench taken from the seating area in the social hall. Psst, Kenny, you're supposed to kiss me now. <laughs> well, I may not have known what the word improvise meant, but I arose from my poisoned slumber and I chased Kenny Epstein, <laughs> the cutest nine-year-old in camp, around the wishing well. <laughs> my Prince Charming was not escaping without a kiss. He kissed me but on the cheek. Now that Snow White took place in a summer bungalow colony in Mountaindale, New York in the Catskills. We lived in the first little bungalow. My grandfather, Oscar Markowitz, who was about 75 at the time, was taking care of me. During the week, my mother worked in the city and she would come up and visit us on weekends. And we lived in the smallest bungalow, a little unwinterized cabin with a screened-in porch. It was the first one of a long, long line of bungalows. And the children went off to activities all day and we just came back for lunch. In fact, they blew whistles at night and depending on your age, the parents didn't even have to put you to sleep. So after rehearsal, one morning, I came back for lunch, and I was so excited. And I ran, and I ran, and I ran back, and I pushed open that screen door, and it clattered behind me. And, and I said to my grandpa, 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 when I grow up, I'm going to be an actress. He turned from the stove with a blackened frying pan in one hand, a dish rag in the other, and his herniated belly followed a moment later. And he just looked at me with the strangest look, didn't say a word, and then turned back to burning my lunch. <laughs> that weekend, my mother came up to see me as Snow White. Perfect page boy, peasant blouse, dirndl skirt, blue ribbon in my hair. And when the play was over, I said to my mother, Ma, Ma, when I grow up, I am going to be an actress. An actress? You'll never make any money as an actress. <sighs> Forget this nourish kite, this foolishness, she said, between puffs of her pack-a-day unfiltered Pall Mall cigarettes. <sighs> An actress. Do, do something respectable. Um, during the Depression, Cousin Jenny was a teacher, and her family never went hungry. So forget this nourish kite, this foolishness, and uh, be a teacher. Well, something must have penetrated, because I did become a teacher. I became a high school English and journalism teacher, actually not far from here, at Washington Irving High School on 17th Street. And I would teach during the day with a severe part and a long ponytail and a monochromatic pantsuit, but it, school was over. I'd take out my hair, put on a tight-fitting leotard, and clutch backstage under my arm the casting newspaper. And I would perform in strange places because it was between the East Village and the West Village, the heyday of the off and the off, off Broadway movement. So I would perform in black boxes and art galleries and storefronts. And one day, when I was not far from here, going down into the sub sub basement of Ruth Malachek's avant garde theater, I just stopped and I said, Why am I doing this? This is so hard. 
what's grabbing me around the neck like a dybbuk or something, a demon, and not letting me go? I have no role models. Nobody in my family is an actor. Why am I doing this? This is so difficult. Why am I hitting my head against the wall? And then my foot froze. And all of a sudden, I could hear his voice flooding back to me, singing to me in a language I didn't understand. How could I have forgotten? How could I have forgotten that my grandfather, Oscar Markowitz, he of the burning lunches, was not always Oscar Markowitz? How could I have forgotten? He was once Usher Marku, an actor, an actor in the Yiddish theater in Romania. How could I have forgotten? And he told me that he was playing King Lear in Yiddish. And he had to have been a very fine actor because the Rothschild banking family that dominated all the capitals of Europe in the previous century was sponsoring his acting troupe. But they were not going on an international tour. The Rothschilds were helping these poor Jewish actors to escape from the persecution, the poverty, and the bloody pogroms that was plaguing Eastern Europe at the time, a pogrom, a government-sanctioned race riot against Jews, a government-sanctioned riot where they looked the other way. When he was 12 years old, Jewish boys couldn't have a public education anymore. And since Jews were not citizens of Romania, jobs were not protected. And overnight, 40% of the men lost their jobs. And I was recently reading a modern book called Pogrom about the most heinous of these crimes in the early 1900s. And I copied a section of this book that I must read to you. And when these words jumped out at me, I said, we have not come very far in a 100 years. A human being for whom there exists no obligation to treat with justice possessed no true rights. In the absence of such protection, the belief prevailed that beating, even killing, Jews was justified. No decree, no commission, no jail time could dislodge such assumptions reinforced daily by government hostility. And the hate speech that's percolating today must have incited a young man to go into a synagogue in Pittsburgh and decide that he should kill 11 Jews while they were worshiping because of their faith. A pogrom, a government incited race riot against Jews and other people as well. My mother-in-law once wrote a letter to the editor at a local newspaper in New York. There must have been something anti-Semitic, and she wrote about a pogrom, and she defined it. They thought it was a typographical error, and when they published her letter, they spelled pogrom, P-O-G-R-O-M, as program. She went right back to them, and she insisted they correct it and reprint the letter, and they did. But how could I have forgotten that my grandfather, my grandfather's life was saved because he wound up here, Second Avenue, New York City, the heyday of the Yiddish theater. How could I have forgotten? And his voice sang to me in a language that I didn't understand. And he told me about the Adlers, the dynasty of the acting family, and the shifts who supported them. And he told me that when the immigrants brought their families to the theater, they didn't just sit back to be entertained. The theater was a temple of learning. They would grab their children and they would say, see, see that man suffering on stage? That's what you're doing to us, you ungrateful first generation American children. <laughs> Show us the respect. Look how that man suffers on stage. Why can't you just respect the old ways? This was not Shakespeare's King Lear. This was 
Goldfaden's King Lear. This was a suffering King Lear, this was a guilty King Lear, this was a Jewish King Lear. <laughs> they actually just did a revival not too far from here, and this is where it all happened. And then here, down on the Lower East Side, Second Avenue, he met a, a lanceman, a relative, Dora, and they fell in love. And her feet were firmly planted on the ground, not standing on a pedestal of poetry in the harbor. And she introduced my grandfather to her father. And she said, Papa, Papa, this is, this is Usher Marku. He's an actor. No, 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 he's a very good actor. He's a Jewish actor. He's in the Yiddish theater. And curses in Yiddish spewed forth from his mouth. No daughter of mine will marry an actor. An actor is a gun of a thief, a dog, the lowest of the low. And he said to my grandfather, if you want to marry my daughter, you forget this nourishkeit, this foolishness, and you do something respectable. How could he choose? Would King Lear be silenced? Would he close his throat? How could he choose between his passion that had saved his life or the woman that would be the only family he would ever know in this new world? And so he compromised, and he became a respectable and often unemployed house painter. Oh, not an ordinary house painter. He was an artist. He could hand stencil beautifully and gild coffered ceilings adorning other people's dreams while designs for his own lay in a Siena portfolio, tattered, unframed, with forged signatures. And he was bitter and frustrated for the rest of his life. Except when he would sing to me, and I would sit by his knee, and he would hold court in his Bronx rent-controlled apartment. And he would sit on his throne, a gray brocaded armchair with fringes along the bottom. And he would sing to me in this language that I didn't understand. But his chest would rise and his hands would rise and his stubby fingers ending in these unusual moon-shaped nails. And he would rail to the heavens, singing all the frustration and anger and sadness of King Lear. But he would be a young man of 19 again in the year 1900 when he came to this country with the promise of a new century in front of him and the promise of anything that he could do. And although King Lear was suffering, he was joyous and sang to me with this basso profundo voice. And in his 90s would be that young man again. And although I may not have known what each word meant individually, his song still sings inside me in a mama lotion, in a mother tongue, and needs no translation. Here's a picture of him at 19. I have a feeling this, these clothes were borrowed because he couldn't have afforded anything looking as good. And just in case you doubt the fact that there might have been a Jewish King Lear on the Lower East Side, this is the cover sheet to the libretto, and it was published in 1899 at 632 Broadway. Thank you.